Isn't our God awesome? Oh my God, he's so amazing. I have um, a residue of having seen the sight and sound production of Daniel today. Oh my God. It was so prophetic. If you have the opportunity, I, I really encourage you to go. But what I recall about that experience was what, what David was just sharing about the presence of the Lord. And you all remember Daniel was taken from his home in Jerusalem and taken into captivity in Babylon. And from his, as a young child, he was a teenager by that time, you know, in his mind, God was in Jerusalem in the temple. So when he came to Babylon, he didn't have a concept that God was everywhere. So I don't know if this ever happened, but in the, in the production, he had a meeting with Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was, ex was explaining to him, he's not just in Jerusalem in the temple. He's everywhere. And that is when you saw Daniel begin to operate in the understanding that he was not, not with, he was within the reach of God, even though he wasn't in Jerusalem. And it was just so powerful, the whole uh, production of how God used him in dreams. And I think it's interesting. Barbie Breathed is coming. I believe we are the Daniel generation. And we really do need that uh, equipping to operate in dreams and visions. So I'm excited to be here this weekend. I, I want to see how we sharpen that gift of dreams and interpretation of dreams because I really believe God is going to use that mightily in this end time. Amen. So with that, I just want to, um, I just want to pray. Um, I just feel like this is a weighty message on the, the talking about accomplishing forgiveness. And um, I just want to just pray into what the Lord wants to do here. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord God. There is nothing that we have done that could separate us from your love. And Father, we thank you that this is a safe place. Lord God, that you are here in our midst and it is your desire that we would walk in total freedom. And Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the, for the um, foundation that has been laid here by apostles Peter and Tricia as we release um, this Possessing Your Vessel um, series, but also as we release the potential for deliverance and breakthrough in every life. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this honor. And, and in Jesus' name, we take authority over any spirit of shame, condemnation, fear, intimidation that would try to attack any of our minds as we reflect on this topic of unforgiveness. And we thank you, Lord God, that you will show us your mighty power of forgiveness and that you have given us your ability, your strength to forgive. If we can't do it in ourselves, we can do it in you. And Lord, we say thank you for you have been the one who has forgiven us and therefore we are recipients of grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, <clears throat> so I have um, a, few, a few charts um, that I prepared. Um, and this morning as I was, I was preparing to go out, I heard the Lord say to me, and it's funny because I just had a, had a conversation with Lisa Melillo about sound. And the Lord said this to me, and I'm going to see if I can just, just bring this up. What does that sound like? <laughs> Interference, right? Well, the Lord shared with me. He said, that's what unforgiveness does to us. It brings a, um, a distraction that blocks us. And therefore, we are not 
fully walking in the potential God has for us because of that interference that's coming in through that veil of unforgiveness. And then I had a sound of wind that I found, but you all know that sound. It's, it's a clear sound, right? And the Lord wants us to hear clearly in this hour. So in terms of accomplishing forgiveness, it's when we stand praying, if we hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that our Father in heaven may forgive our sins. That's right there telling us if we are harboring unforgiveness in our hearts, when we pray to the Father, our prayers can be somewhat blocked because we're harboring unforgiveness against someone. And that's not the Lord's best for us. And until forgiveness is affected in the heart, just like David just said, the law of retribution swings to its inevitable conclusion. There is a law of sowing and reaping in the universe. And if we sow unforgiveness, we reap the fruit of whatever that is, of that unforgiveness. In James 1.15, it says, when lust it can, is conceived, it gives birth to sin. So we know that the way the world is designed, it, you know, between, because of probably Adam and Eve, that's why we have unforgiveness in the earth today. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sick, uh, dangerous strategy that the enemy uses to block us. And even after we become born again, we still need to practice and grow in this gift of unforgiveness, of, of forgiveness, because offenses are going to keep coming. I, I had an, an incident the other day, and uh, actually I had one yesterday, so I had to repent because I, I was starting to get a little bit of, of offense and unforgiveness against the rental car company because I called them, and they wasted two hours of my time, and I never rented a vehicle. So I have to repent and I have to say, Lord, help me, Jesus, because I don't want to carry that. The next time I walk into this rental car company, I'm going to be mean to the person because of the previous experience I just had. So I have to get washed up off of that. that. That has to be washed away. But that's just an example of how the offenses are going to keep coming. And so it's up to us to know that we have power to forgive. So what happens when, um, what are the signs that unforgiveness is, is uh, eating away at us? And there were 14 signs that I found as I was doing my research. One was you're experiencing bursts of anger. You're petty and impulsive. You're desperate to make them understand how you feel. You ever met people like that? <laughs> You're compulsive. You're unable to refrain from, refrain your experiences. You're not taking responsibility for your feelings. You're sick. You're keeping a list of offenses. You hate yourself. You replay the scene over and over. Ever talk to somebody and something happened 30 years ago and they replay it like it just happened yesterday? You gossip about them. You're righteous and entitled. You exercise poor judgment. You refuse to confide in others. The word of God says confess your faults and he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from unrighteousness. So it's really important that we uncover what is, is, what is ailing us and what's trying to take root in us and hide. I love the picture of this guy. The heaviest thing you can do is carry a grudge. As long as we remain unrepentant of a bitter root, and we heard Easter talking about that and performance orientation that Cindy shared, um, and then what Anna shared about the, the stony heart, all of those are, are root fruits of unforgiveness. 
And as long as we remain unrepentant of those bitter roots, our response to an emotional stimulus will illustrate the law of sowing and reaping. If we look at the root system of unforgiveness, we see the resulting fruit. As we look at this uh, tree, we see some of the uh, consequences of unforgiveness. Um, chronic illnesses, I mean, they've tracked diabetes, hypertension, arthritis, uh, you name it. All immunodiseases have been linked back to unforgiveness. And now more and more the medical community is acknowledging that. And, that, and, and some of them are the biggest proponents of prayer because they understand if we can get, uh, you know, let's just say connected with eternity in a way that gets us out of our emotions, somehow there's an opportunity for us to forgive and to be healed. And there are constant examples of people who once they forgive someone, they get, they get healed immediately. And it's, it's like that, that emotion has to find its root in us and it, it, it has to express itself. It could express itself in our behavior and it could express itself in sickness and illness in our bodies. Lack of purpose, emotional volatility, relational strife. I don't know, I mean, how many people are in relationship after relationship after relationship? None of the relationships are working. And what's the common denominator? They are. Not the people they're in the relationship with. But if you ask them, they will probably tell you, well, they did this to me or they did that to me. No, you are the common denominator here because you are in the, all the serial relationships that don't work. But if you don't acknowledge that, you're going to continue that cycle. So our emotions murder or bless others. And we know murder destroys life. Only the blood of Jesus can enable us to die to self and stop the increasing cycle of human hate. And they share, in the book, they share an example of this couple. I changed their name, Mary and Barry, for example. So when Mary Jones feels slighted um, by her husband, Barry, her unresolved bitterness to want towards others who have slighted her in the past demands a response. So others who have slighted her in the past are not in this conversation with her husband, but because of how she's been slighted in the past, she is now going to launch out at her husband, Barry. And Barry has a choice when that happens. If, if, she, if he might respond bitter to her as well, or... His anger increases, and guess what? The fight is on. If he suppresses that stimulus, it does not die. It ferments in his heart. You ever remember Pastor Peter says there's no such thing as an unexpressed emotion? Well, this is it. And so how can it express itself? The way he, maybe he goes silent on her. Maybe he avoids her. Maybe he leaves the house. You know, in many ways, even though he might not come back at her the way she came at him, he still took that in, and then he didn't deal with it. So that is an example of how this unforgiveness can continue to be expressing itself. Somewhere, somehow, there, that, that, that root of unforgiveness has to be exposed and dealt with. The other option Barry has is to give back a loving answer. And I don't know about you all, but sometimes I have to practice the, what you call that, the delayed response one. You know what you have to say, five, four, three, two, one. And yes, and pray you don't go launching back out at the person the way they launched at you. And it's always helpful to take a deep breath to reflect and to wait before you respond. And you know what? 
in that way, the Holy Spirit has an opportunity to get in the mix and, and just give us, give us grace. How about that? We need grace in order not to launch back out at the person the way they launched at us. So because we live in this legal universe, that hurt always has to find a response. And if we think about that scenario I just shared, playing itself out multiple, multiple times, it causes an increase in, um, let's just say, bad behavior and bad relationships in, in our, in our, in our, even in our, the way we live as a community. And we used to have a picture, I don't know if we still have that, but we used to have in Possessing Your Vessel a picture of a room where there was a rug. And when something happened, we just kept sweeping it up under the rug. And the rug got higher and higher and higher. And before you knew it, this rug that was flat on the ground was like a mountain. And now we have this insurmountable thing that now we can't even walk around in the room because we've been sweeping it up under the rug for so long. That's what happens when unforgiveness is in the atmosphere, in our hearts, and demands a response without being dealt with. So let's look at the cause and effect of this emotional stimuli. As long as, long as we remain unrepentant of a bitter root, our response to an emotional stimulus, stimulus will illustrate the law of sowing and reaping. And this scripture is such a great example. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is the source not your pleasures that wage war in your body's part, parts? And I love what it says in 2 Samuel 14, 14. Yet God does not take away a life, but he devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. Isn't that beautiful? The laws of sowing and reaping and of increase, all of our human relationships are continually causing our sin to flesh. So we have that ever accelerating war uh, and destruction. And the only resolution for that is the cross. It's the blood of Jesus. Only the blood of Jesus can stop this cycle. And I love what, um, what, is, what is said here about how the blood applied is the key and how we get healed in community. The reality is that this is our family. As much as our natural family, this is our family. And so when we enter into this place, we enter into this place as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And we can get healed in this community. And there's opportunity for us to be transparent, to, to share with one another, and to, hey, just lay it out there. And say, this is what I'm dealing with. Can you pray with me? How about an accountability partner? How about connecting with people who we, we, we trust? And I think that's the other part of unforgiveness that we need to also be aware of is that it causes a lack of trust. But I really believe that we, as a body of Christ, are going to have to lead the way. Because how in the world is the world going to overcome all of this strife and contention unless we demonstrate how forgiveness really works? So the cause and effect of, emotion, of this emotional stimuli. In that illustration I shared, um, I, about Mary and Barry, Barry's choice to love was an invitation by choosing to walk in the light. First John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so Barry chose 
to take the invitation to walk in the light, to allow the blood of Jesus to cleanse his heart. And thank God for Jesus that he knew we would be in a continual struggle with this thing. And that's why he said in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, he said that we should do this as often as we think of it. As often as we think of it, we should commune with him. Do this in remembrance of me. The act of communion serves as a cleansing agent, a reminder of what Christ has done for us. That's so important because I think about how, I don't know if you've had this experience, but I would say things like, they don't deserve my forgiveness. But it's not about what they deserve. It's about what the unforgiveness is doing to me. And so, you know, I have this thing I say sometimes, which is, last time I checked, I didn't have any nail prints in my hand. So why am I making this such a big deal? What's the cost to forgive someone? Yeah, there's no cost. There's only gain. And who gets the gain? I get the gain because I've chosen to forgive. And so this act of communion reminds us Jesus already went to the cross. He already paid the price. So now as I commune with him, I get to be a partaker of his divine nature. And his nature is to forgive. His nature is to show grace and show mercy. And I need to constantly be reminded of who I belong to. I'm not of this world. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. So I have to operate from a different paradigm. I have to operate from a different mindset and values. And I love that the act of communion serves as that cleansing agent. I like this, the fact that Jesus is constantly giving us opportunities to get this right. Thank God. I had an opportunity the other day. And, and, it, and again, thank God for 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Because the Lord get, came and he wanted me to go do something. He wanted me to connect with someone. And in my heart, I didn't want to do it. And I was ready to dismiss it. Except 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And I relented and I connected with the person. And it ended up being a, a, a wonderful thing. For that individual. But what if I had allowed the unforgiveness that I've experienced in the past or the offense that I've experienced in the past block me from connecting with that person? They would have lost the blessing and so would have I. So God is, is constantly testing us and testing our heart. I love this illustration of, oh, I'm sorry, um, um, could you go forward? Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm, you know what? I'm going to do that one after. I'm going to do that one after number. Yeah, if you could go forward, please. I'll tell you when to come back. Okay, you can go forward. Great. So um, that's not the right one. I'm on number seven. Okay, go back one more. One more? Okay, we'll find it. No worries. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> so, unforgiveness compared to uprooting the sycamine tree. And I don't know if you all are familiar with this tree, but this is the tree Jesus referenced in Luke 17, 6. If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. And this tree, um, if, you, if you look at it, it had very large roots, and it's found throughout the Middle East. 
very difficult to kill because the roots go down so deep that even if you cut the root, it's not a guarantee that the tree would die. And they're hidden deep under the ground. So Jesus used this tree as an example of bitterness and unforgiveness. And his, uh, what, he, what he was saying is you've got, in order to uproot this thing, you, it's like you've got to pluck it up and you've got to put it in the sea. And it's not easily done unless you deal with the roots of bitterness and unforgiveness. And I remember uh, reading briefly through Jennifer Ives' book on inner healing. You all might have read it. Or she was here to minister and left her book, and it's a great book. But she tells a story in the book of how she was at a, a service, some kind of spiritual service. And at the service, um, she was going forward for prayer. And as she was going forward for prayer, a voice said to her, you hate them. And she looked, and there were people in Anglic Anglican collars. She didn't understand what that was related to, but apparently in her root system, there was an issue because she has English and Scandinavian background where there was an issue with the Anglican church. And so as she's walking past these people with these collars on, the Holy Spirit speaks to her, and she, ha and she goes up to one of them, and she says, I want to repent to you. She says, I repent for how I have harbored hate towards you and unforgiveness towards you. Now, that's something that was hidden very deep that she would never even have thought was an issue, but because she's walking by and this, a voice comes to her and says, you hate them, she knew she had to deal with it right on the spot. That's an example of something that's deeply rooted that if you don't think about, if you're not encountering it, you would, ever, you would never know. And I think about that so much if I think about how in our households where we grew up, you know, bigotry is, is coming from a mindset in our household where people say, oh, we don't hate that, we hate that group. We don't like this group. Or we don't associate with that group. All of that gets ingrained in a child that's growing up in a household where that kind of unforgiveness and hatred is just commonplace. And sometimes if you don't have a renewed mind in Christ, you don't deal with it. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people in the body of Christ who are born again, who walk around with those beliefs. That's not pleasing to God. And if you think about it, think about how the church is so divided in this season. It still is not the most integrated time on a Sunday morning because people believe that if I'm not with my group, then I'm not in the kingdom. And that's not true. But if you look, you can see evidence of how this unforgiveness has generational um, implications with it. In other words, you know, my mom hated, so I hate. My mom believed this, so I believe that. And if you, you know, and I, I can speak to this because, you know, I have relatives who were harassed by the KKK, who were, who were treated badly. And as a result, they, you know, they, they shared with, with the generations after them what happened to them, how they were treated. And if you hear their stories, they're horrifying. But if they've not practiced unforgiveness, I mean forgiveness towards those who have done wrong to them, how then can they, in a, in a positive way, communicate that to their families? So that's just an example of how deep-rooted uh, some of these issues of unforgiveness can be. Thank you. We could go to the next slide. I talked about communion. The next slide, um, I'm sorry, we're going to go back to the, the sports squares. Thank you. 
Does anyone recognize this? Oh, yeah. So how many of you have not seen this? Oh, that's good. Quite a few of you. This is um, a Pastor Peter favorite. Um, and it's one of mine, too. Um, I, I love the Johari window. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background, it's, it's a technique designed to help people better understand their relationships with themselves and others. It was created by a, two psychologists, Joseph Luff and Harrington Ing Ingham. So they call it the Joe Harry window, Joe for Joseph and Harry for Harrington. Basically, when you look at this, uh, this chart, there are four rooms in here. Room one is a part of ourselves that both we and others can see into. Room two contains aspects that others see, but we are unaware of. Room three is the unconscious part of us that neither ourselves nor others see. And room four is the private space we know, but hide from others. So when we look at this window, the, the wisdom that I have gained from understanding this window is that we all have blind spots. There are things about us that are not known to us, but known to others. And that's in that top uh, right quadrant. The, the, the bottom one is there are things that we don't know about ourselves and that others don't know about us. That's not a happy place to be. We wanna, we wanna decrease the size of that window. Then there's the, the window that we're, we know about but we don't share with us. But the one part of this that really is the arena that is the healthiest is that we are known to ourselves and we are known to others. So the part about the Johari window that's important, you see that upper left where it says arena? The goal is to bring that back and make it as big as possible. That's where transparency lives. And um, so much, I think, wisdom is in this, understanding the importance of how to deal with this. And I saw a video once of a gentleman who was dealing with this. He had relocated from the East Coast to the West Coast. He was working on a team, and they were talking about this window. And when they talked to him about the window, they said, you know, you, you, you tend to have like an abrupt attitude sometimes, like you want to hurry up and get things done, you're not willing to wait and hear others' opinions. And so they helped him to see himself in a way that he, that he was not able to see himself. So he, he got revelation on that, and as he did, he was then able to shift his behavior. And now he had a much more positive working relationship with his team. What's the point of this? The point of this is that many times we're the last ones to know what we're putting out there. Now, people will see us putting it out there, but they won't tell us we're putting out bad vibes or we have behaviors that are not productive. And so as a result, we can walk around in a blind spot unless we seek feedback and say, you know, what, is there something in me that you think is a hindrance in my walk? Whatever you want it, whatever it is. Feedback is the key to being able to grow that arena of transparency. And, um, and there are lots of ways to do it. But hopefully as a body of Christ, we should, we should be experts at this. We should be the ones who are constantly saying, hey, how can I improve in this area? What can I do? What do you think about how I'm, you know, you know, let's just say managing a project or whatever. People, if they know you're really sincerely looking for that feedback, they can help you. This is a great way to deal with issues of unforgiveness because we can take the veil off of some stuff 
and begin to deal with it in an arena where we feel safe. So um, I really encourage you to, to continue to, to look at that Jahari window. It's a, it's a, great, uh, a great tool. Thank you, Reyes. We're going to go to Learn to Fly Blind. So the Learn to Fly Blind um, uh, belief is this, that the greatest challenge with forgiveness is that most often we do not know we still cherish resentment. Or that we have lied to ourselves. People almost inevitably think that they have forgiven when they haven't. How do we know if we haven't forgiven? We got fruit, right? You ever, you ever think about Monday morning, getting up to go to work? And you're like, I don't want to deal with that, that boss today. I don't want to deal with these coworkers today. If I, if that person says one thing, I'm, 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 I'm telling you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna release on them. So that's the fruit. That's how we know we haven't dealt with some stuff. And so what we need to do is look at the fruit and know that where there's fruit, there's a what? There's a root. And you know, I, I have had to deal with this. Um, myself in working relationships with authority. And sometimes it went back to my family relationships. There were things that were, that I experienced in my childhood that affect how I relate to my, my superiors and my coworkers. So what I have to do is I have to repent and I have to get, you know, cleaned. I have to apply the blood, I have to worship, I have to break free. Of, of whatever that is. So we use this illustration of learning to fly blind. In Isaiah 42, 19, they said, who is blind but my servant? Or so deaf as my messenger whom I, whom I send? Who is so blind as he that is at peace with me? Or so blind as the servant of the Lord? Isaiah 11, 3, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. So this is a picture of a cockpit of a Black Hawk. So many years ago, my brother was, he, he, he was flying Black Hawks, and he said, oh, I'm going to bring you guys into the simulator so you can see what it's like to fly a Black Hawk. So he said, but don't look out, don't look out in the, Outside in the, in the atmosphere, you have to fly by instrumentation. If you don't fly by instrumentation, you, you're, you're going to crash. So it was fun, and we, we all got in there, and he gave us some little instruction, and I don't think I lasted two seconds because I was so busy looking through the window to see where I was going, what I was doing, that I didn't use the instrumentation. That's how we have to be with the Lord. We have to learn to fly blind. Don't look at what we see, but sense what Holy Spirit is saying to us. How is Holy Spirit directing us? What are we hearing in the spirit? What are we seeing in the spirit? It's not about what we see. Because if we're guided by what we see, just like I crashed and burned in a two, in a two second, you're going to crash and burn. <laughs> and so many times we think about... Um, unforgiveness, but don't realize how it has also affected our identity. In other words, we don't have the truest view of who we really are because it's cloaked in unforgiveness. I think God has given us keys in this hour to unlock many people who are trapped in identities that are not theirs because there's a root of unforgiveness. Jesus. 
I want to go back to the, the chart on communion. Um, and this is really, I, I touched on it briefly, but I really want to go back to um, this, this whole concept of Hebrews 10, 23 to 27. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment in the fury of fire which consume the adversaries. It's really important that we understand the importance of coming and meeting together as a body. And so much, I don't know if you sense it, but I felt like after COVID, there's been such an increase in mental health um, and all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. And I really, really believe that it's rooted in isolation. Some of us, not, not, not here in this body, but I know a lot of people who think they're a member of a body and they're in their bed every Sunday eating bonbons. And I, I, like someone said, they said, you know, if they're, in, if they're home wa watching online, and this is not to, to disparage anybody who's watching online now, that's not what this is about. But they actually have some kind of evidence to say that they may be tuned in online, but they're scrolling their social media. So it's not like they're really engaging in the, in the, in the, the meeting itself because they're distracted. And what John and Paula Sanford said in their book, they said, we rejoice because we know that those who do attend worship, whether communion is served or not, will be cleansed by walking in the light and their marriages and families will be blessed. There is something about proximity, about coming together as a body, the way we worship, yeah, maybe some people think it's a lot, but I don't know about you, but I get a lot of breakthrough in our worship. I get, when I walk in one way and we come in and we begin to worship and glorify God, I go out a total different way. I have come in here some days and I barely have strength to walk through the door, but once I come into that worship, it's like a cleansing comes over me and I forgot what was ailing me before I walked in the door. There's a healing power that's going forth when the presence of the Lord is in the room and there's a corporate gathering. Yes, you can. You will forgive that person. Yes, you will walk in that forgiveness. Why? Because we're so grateful. We celebrate what Jesus did on the cross. It reminds us that we are recipients of this amazing forgiving grace that God has given each one of us. Why would we not share that with others? My God. So how do we deal with the past? One of the things that we could do is we can, forgiveness can be accomplished in the hidden heart. That's so important. We don't need to go find a person and have a conversation and tell them we forgive them. We don't need to do all that. The first forgiveness happens in the hidden heart. Secondly, frequently resentments lie totally beneath the heart and mind. So we need to understand that it's okay because resentment is, is, is there, but once we recognize it, we can begin to take action and deal with it. We should be more concerned about the practices of the flesh. If there are practices of the flesh that are contrary to the will of God, then we need to 
Acknowledge that and say, now, Lord, show me where there's unforgiveness related to these practices in the flesh. If bad fruit persists, forgiveness is not yet accomplished. We just talked about that. The only route to the cross is through Gethsemane. Lisa shared, with that, shared that with us on Sunday. In other words, Jesus had to forgive before he went to the cross. So it's the same thing with us. We have to forgive and then nail that thing to the cross, never to return again. And forgiveness happens before death. We have to die to ourselves. Even as Jesus petitioned, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So we have to be willing to, to die to self, uproot that, that, that tree with those deep roots, the bitter roots, and, and move forward in freedom through forgiveness. I'd like us to, I did, did everyone get the handout? I wanted to um, just take a moment. There's um, quite a few Bible verses here for, for you to, to um, meditate on. But I want to look at uh, one of these prayers. The prayer of repentance and for forgiveness in returning to the forgiving heart of God. Um, I, I really love this because it really, to me, if we put God in the midst of this practice of forgiveness, it becomes a lifestyle. And so it's not just a one time and one, one and done. What did Jesus say? How many times do we forgive? Seventy times seven. And I tell you, I think I've forgiven people, and even after I've forgiven them, it feels like I already forgave them for that. Why is that coming back again? Like Anna did with her testimony last week. She said it became fresh again. So guess what? That means that was fruit that had a root. And so don't ignore it. We go to the cross with it. And we say, Lord, and I love the way Anna illustrates. She said, I cried it out. Sometimes you just got to cry it out. And release it and give it to God and say, Lord, I don't want this any, I don't want this anymore. I yield it to you. Take it from me. Free me, God, from this. And when we do that, that costs us nothing. That's a private conversation. You know the beauty of forgiveness? No one else has to know. We just, it's a conversation between us and God. And you know what? It works, especially if we're sincere in bringing it to him um, with, our, with a sincere heart. I want to just read, if I would like us to, to read this together. I just think it's so powerful. Uh, returning to the forgiving heart of God. Oh, Lord, my Redeemer, I come before you with a heavy heart, weighed down by the weight of my transgressions. The weight of my sin is a burden too heavy to bear alone, and so I seek your face, O Lord, in this time of repentance. I acknowledge my sins, the times I have fallen short, and the moments I have chosen my way over yours. I am truly sorry for the pain my actions have caused, not only to others, but to your loving heart as well. God, you know my innermost thoughts, and nothing is hidden from your sight. In your loving kindness, you sent your son Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. Through his sacrifice, the door to redemption and reconciliation was open. I ask, dear Father, for your mercy and forgiveness. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness and create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. May your spirit convict and correct me, leading me back to the path of righteousness. Amen. Amen.
I don't know about you, but that felt good. I can say that over and over again, and I know that God is working out whatever it is. And Lord, I give you permission to bring to my remembrance whatever it is. Even if I forgot about it, Lord, bring it back. Remind me again of areas that I still need to release forgiveness. There's the last page of this is something that we always used to do. Um, it's called the gift of forgiveness. And um, I, what I like about this is think about forgiveness as a gift, a beautiful wrap package that you give to the person who has offended you and who has transgressed against you. And when you do that, God is, God is pleased. And also, there's the gift of forgiveness that we give to ourselves because I think a lot of times we've not forgiven ourselves. And I know I've been guilty of reflecting back on something and saying, ah, why did I do that? I knew better than that. I went and did it anyway. Give yourself the gift of forgiveness. God is not holding anything against us. Why would we hold anything against ourselves? Amen. Let us just stand. I just want to pray for, as we uh, prepare to go forward. And just um, thank God for his mercy. I really, um, I, I feel so encouraged by this opportunity that we have to demonstrate the love of God through forgiveness. Um, and I, I really would like to just pray that as we leave here today or tonight, that God brings to our remembrance anything that we might have forgotten. But more importantly, I feel like God wants to use us as demonstrations of what forgiveness looks like. Lord Jesus. Father, make us instruments of your peace. Father, let us be those vessels who are willing to walk in the arena, that transparent arena where we're known by others and known by ourselves. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that you seal the understanding of forgiveness in our hearts, Lord God, and that you give us strength to, to, to continue to press into forgiveness. And I thank you, Lord, how you've grown me up. Even in this difficult season, you've grown me up, God. You've shown me levels of forgiveness that I never thought I could see. Lord, I thank you. You're so merciful. And Lord, I bless this opportunity that you've given us. I bless every household represented. Lord, I declare a decree, reconciliation coming to families. Lord God, as we are willing to be the ones who extend the olive branch in our families and go to those who have been estranged and extend forgiveness. Lord, give us your grace to be the example that will break the bondage of isolation and, and, and division off our families, Lord God, that we would become one again. Lord God, that you would store the hearts of the children back to the father and the hearts of the fathers back to the children. Lord God, that you would meet, meet us in this family revival with forgiveness as a key. We receive it. We receive, Lord God. We receive the gift to forgive, 
to love freely. We receive the cleansing of your blood over our minds. We receive the cleansing of your blood over our past. We receive the cleansing of your blood over our bloodline, even for those things, Lord God, we didn't do, but we carry in our members. Lord, we receive your forgiveness, and we release it. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this revival of forgiveness. Lord God, I thank you that it becomes center stage in our lives and in our body here. In Jesus' name, amen.